The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at www.dallasgenealogy.org. And with that, that concludes our business meeting, and we're going to get to the reason why I know many of us are here. Cheryl, you want to come up here and do some introductions? Hi, everybody. I'm Cheryl Freeman, and I'm really excited to be introducing our speakers today. Um, our first speaker is going to be Shirley Sloat, and Shirley's presentation is entitled, It Takes a Village to Produce a Book Preserving the Memories of the Only Living Grandchild of Two Georgia Slaves Who Came in a Wagon with Nine Children to Wheelock, Texas in 1894. Also speaking to us will be Estelle Mitchell Adams, who is that only living grandchild, and I'm so pleased you're here with us today, Estelle. Shirley met Estelle at an aqua exercise class in 2013, and the two became friends. Estelle shared many written documents about the Negro churches, the schools, and the cemetery in Wheelock. When Estelle showed Shirley that she remembered the names of all but about 12 of the 40 students attending the Wheelock Colored School in 1934, Shirley knew that she had to help Estelle capture her voice and her memories for the public. So their collaboration has led to the publication of the book, Remembering ne Negro Life in Wheelock, Texas, the Church's Schools, Cemetery, and Families in the 1900s. Copies of the book are available here today. Shirley spent the past two years organizing, editing, and indexing Estelle's mere remembrances. Um, she will be discussing creating a book in general, the challenges of creating one with a storyteller, and to give inspiration to those who might have been afraid to try publishing their own work. We'll also have a brief talk from Estelle um, followed by Shirley's account of the various events and help provided along the way by a lot of people and organizations, like the Texas Portal, the University of North Texas, the Dallas Public Library, and Dallas Genealogical Society members, particularly with thanks to Ed Millis, who just likes to make books, and who tells about things like how to achieve an ISBN number. Shirley has a deep history with us. She um, uh, began, uh, joined the Ge Dallas Genealogical Society as a life member after she retired in 1992. She began working at the Dallas Public De uh, Library eighth floor volunteer desk, where you can still see her on Wednesdays. She also proofreads uh, publications for us. Over the years, she chaired the publicity committee. She served on the Dallas Genealogical Society board as vice president of membership, executive fundraising, and then president in 2005, 2006. She has received awards from our society for the writing contest. She's been volunteer of the year. She's received awards for historical preservation and the award of merit. She's also received the Dallas Public Library Award of Excellence twice and the A.C. Green Award from the Friends of the Dallas Public Library. I want to also mention that Estelle is the author of three other publications that are available online on the Portal to Texas History that Tony talked about before. These are the history of the Wheelock African American Cemetery, Wheelock, Robertson County, Texas, preserving the history of Wheelock Colored School, Wheelock, Robertson County, Texas, and the Texas are the black churches in Wheelock, Robertson County, Texas. So please go to the portal and take a look at those. And I'd like to bring Shirley up now and Estelle. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. The only thing that you missed putting on it was that I'm the lady who has the face on the side of the Dallas Bookmobile. <laughs> uh, the, the face on the, the bus was a couple years ago, they were getting a second bookmobile and were getting a brand new one, and so they sent out a call for all kinds of people of all ages and, and ethnic groups and children and everybody to come out, and we all met down, and they selected a few people to take pictures of. 
And I got my face on there because I was sitting at a computer with my hair looking like this, and it's to say that old people can use computers. <laughs> so it's on one of the two buses, and I never know which one, but occasionally someone will say, hey, I saw you out in whatever area of Dallas that those buses go. <clears throat> I want to thank all of you in the audience for coming today to hear about my dear friend Estelle and to share vicariously some of the pleasures that we had during the creation of her book. I'm also very pleased to see so many familiar faces in today's crowd, both old and new friends from various organizations. This J. Eric Johnson Central Dallas Public Library has been my home away from home for many years, and I hope that some of you will be able to spend a little time after our meeting today to explore not only the eighth floor, which is genealogy, but the newly renovated seventh floor of Dallas History and Archives collection of material about the history of Dallas and the surrounding area, as well as the state of Texas. And there are a couple of really major things that are there that are historic and just wouldn't take you a minute to look at it, but it's a beautiful, beautiful floor that they've just opened up. But they have uh, two, the two prominent is, are what's called the Dunlap Bronze side of the Declaration of Independence. There were three of these made. There, three of them exist now, and this is the only one that is west of the Mississippi, and it's a really a, a very historical thing to go see. And the other is Shakespeare's first folio, which is wonderful. But it's brand new, and uh, I think you would very much enjoy visiting them. Here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about creating a book in general, and then shedding some light on the challenges of creating one with the storyteller. I think this list has probably been read as part of the introduction, but, but I want to give courage to those of you who might not have started doing anything like this, and maybe you'd be uh, enlightened and, and ready to do that. And then particularly at the very end, to identify the key support from people and organizations. These are the villagers that helped us predict, uh, create the book. So the collaboration, you've already talked about how Estelle and I uh, how Estelle and I met at, at our exercise class at the uh, Finley Ewing Exercise Place at the uh, Cardiovascular Center is associated with Presbyterian Hospital on Greenville Avenue. And this was about three years we met, and uh, she was just recovering from some surgery on her back, and I had been there for several years at this from some minor surgery on a knee many years before. But anyway, we met each other, and we, as we talked and walked laps and did all kinds of things, we, we got to know each other, and we had some good chemistry. We, we really enjoyed visiting with each other. So um, I invited her out for her 87th birthday dinner at the Red Lobster restaurant, because we both like fish, so we went there. And um, we, we sat down, and the uh, waiter came over to us and, and asked if this was any kind of a special day. And I said, oh, yes, it's Estelle's birthday. And he said, uh, would you mind if we celebrated that somehow, as the staff do like that? So Estelle said that would be fine with her. And um, <clears throat> so we sat down, and uh, sure enough, during the course of the dinner, why, uh, the staff came up, and they all sang happy birthday. And what I was surprised by was the fact that um, there were a whole lot of the people that were just regular diners there that also sang very vigorously with it. It was a great happy birthday song they did. So um, when we were ready to, and we began talking, and I explained to you, Estelle, would you, would you like to sit down instead of standing there? Good girl, good girl. <laughs> She's fun to work with, I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, I shared for the first time uh, with her uh, m my passion for genealogical research. And then she began telling me that she'd like to know more about her grandparents, Sam and Lucy Mitchell, ex-slaves who came from Georgia to settle in Texas. And so we lingered a long time discussing this and lots of other things. But eventually, I asked the waiter for our check. And to my surprise, he said it would be necessary for him to call the manager. And we kind of gulped, having no idea what this was. But it turns out the good news was when the manager appeared, he said that our meal had been comped by some other guests who had already left <laughs> and had even taken care of the tip. It was a lovely surprise, of course. But as we left, we both agreed that although we couldn't thank our benefactors, we could pay it forward somehow. And I have to think that by preserving Estelle's memories of family and the local history, we are in our own way paying it forward. Okay, another thing that... Well, back up just one step. Thank you. Uh, another thing that happened, there was an obituary that appeared in the paper soon after this that was for her last living sim sibling. That was uh, her brother, B.F. 
he died, and Estelle, I know, I found out later, did write the obituary, and it was so well done and told me so much about the family that I looked at it and said, I think that I can start building a family tree in my computer software about her family, and that might be helpful, and we might find some things we would be looking for by doing that. So I, I did that, and of course then that led me to looking online for other things, because that's what we do. We find a few things, and then we look for other things around the way. <laughs> So, so uh, and to my amazement, there were many of her family members that I could deduce from this obituary, uh, inventoried on the find a grave records for the Wheelock Afro-American Cemetery located in Robertson County. And so I excitedly told Estelle about this find, and she said she didn't know the information was online, but as it happened, she was the president of the Cemeteries Association and had a significant mailing list used to organize annual meetings of families whose members were buried there and who contributed to the upkeep of the cemetery. I should have known. <laughs> Estelle has continued to surprise me with pieces of information that were truly valuable to understanding the lives of the black families in Wheelock. And the final piece was when she showed me a picture, and now we'll show that picture if you don't mind. Thank you. Of, of the approximately 40 students and teachers in the Wheelock Colored School in 1934. She was about seven at the time of the picture. And if you can do your magic, Kathleen, we're gonna highlight where Estelle is. There she is. She, oh, back up and hold that again. There she is. Now she has her head kind of leaning on either a brother or a sister that she's there, and she looks like a tiny little thing with a sweet. But the amazing thing about this picture, what blew my mind was that with the picture, she had a list of the names of all but about 12 of those people in that picture. That is incredible. I could not name two or three in my first five years of going to elementary school, and she remembered all these people. So it was amazing, and that was enough to convince me that we had to do something to save her memories in a permanent way. So before I talk about how we took her information and put it into what ended up being a book, I want to introduce to you our author, Estelle Mitchell Adams. She of the fantastic memory who has lived and is still living at age 89, one of the most active lives I've ever observed. Uh, I've asked her to speak to our group for 15 or so minutes about life in Wheelock, and I've suggested that she include a few of my favorite events in her talk, but because I trust her storytelling abilities, I'm gonna sit back and listen to her as part of the audience. And once you've heard her, I'm confident that you'll understand why I so happily spent the past couple of years helping to preserve her memories. And here's, this is my favorite picture of Estelle. She is standing in the turnip patch in the sandy soil of Wheelock that was owned and worked by her Mitchell family. So here, without further ado, is my dear friend and book author, Estelle Mitchell Adams. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be invited to be with you today and to meet so many dear friends. I feel highly honored. This is my first book. I have written about uh, my community my churches, churches, the school, cemetery, and my family in 1900. You are blessed to have such a well-established organization. It is a blessing to have this society. What can I say? To the depths of my heart for such an honor and I'm thankful to have a friend like Shirley, the editor and indexing, and the beautiful cover Beverly Haskin did for me. Oral history of the University of North Texas, and also my dear friends, Todd Mario and Ed Mills, who worked closely with me to see this happen. I want to acknowledge first my daughter is here, Derry Hooper. I have one daughter. 
My church family's here. My family and friends are here to support me. And I have two grandchildren, a boy and a girl, Maya and Sherrod. They couldn't be with me today because today is their day to have their class reunion at Texas A&M University and also see a football game. So I gave them the pleasure of staying there to share their fun with their friends and family. And I also would like to acknowledge my dear friend, um, uh, husband, my, God, my, my, my daughter's goddaughter. Glad to see you too. I chose the title because of the times. A book was written about the history of Robinson County by the superintendent of schools. And in his book, very little was written about Negroes in Wheelock. He didn't mention any family names. Neither did he mention the accomplishments of the people in the county, Texas, and the United States. And I talked with him about this. So I decided that I would write my own because I knew something too. <laughs> so I started gathering information. And I gathered enough to put together I thought would be a nice little book. <clears throat> so many of the Negroes in America helped to build this great nation. And their identity is not mentioned or forgotten. So I just wrote a few things about the people in Wheelock, Texas that I knew. And I wrote it also to encourage other people to write. Christianity has progressed through the years on the wing of song from the birth of Jesus Christ to our day. While we cherish and love our past, let us remember to keep building on our future. I was born and raised in Wheelock, Texas, Robinson County, Farm Road 391. The same sandy soil my grandparents purchased in 1900, the late Samuel and Lucy Mitchell. The same sandy soil my father, the late Elijah Mitchell, was raised. My father married my mother Amanda Dunn Mitchell. Her parents gave her a beautiful red heifer cow for her wedding gift. My father's father and mother gave him 12 acres of land for their wedding gift. This is how they started their life's journey. The love and devotion that they had for Wheelock, Texas, and for me, covers 89 years of my life. I had two sisters, four brothers. I am the last living child. I am the last living grandchild of 41 grandchildren. My brothers and sisters chose different careers. I was the only one who went to college. One brother chose his career as truck driving, whatever, and ended up working for the United States Post Office carrying mail. And in the end, he ended up a millionaire. My other brothers chose to stay with the farm and work and raise cattle. They were very successful with those cattle. My two sisters decided that they wanted to be beauticians. They were very successful with their endeavor. Now, you know, um, <clears throat> working on the farm 
is hard work. And with seven children, my father saw that we learned how to work. I worked on the farm. We raised all kinds of vegetables, fruit, cotton, corn, name it. The vegetables and fruit were sold in our grocery store. My mother and father had a little country grocery store. And of course, we had to gather the fruit, put them under the trees so it could be sold. they could be sold. I still was not satisfied <laughs> working in the farm. And of course, I was really a tomboy. I learned how to do everything on the farm, but I love very much riding horses. My parents gave the girls music lessons. I was very successful in music. I was educated in the Wheelock schools. Then I went to Bryan, Texas for my high school training. I received a bachelor's degree from Bishop College in Marshall, Texas. A master's degree from Prairie View University in Prairie View, Texas. Much of my research and study during that time at Prairie View was done at Texas A&M University because there was a great shortage of books in Prairie View's library for us to study. Teachers were scarce. <clears throat> And, of course, many did not want to come to the country schools to work because it was hard work. The teachers had to be the custodian, the nurse, just everything to help have an outstanding school. We walked to school three miles, going and coming, seldom late, seldom missing a day. And of course, we have our brown sack lunches. We studied from out of adoption textbooks, worn furniture, piano out of tune. And of course, we learned we were very, very interested in wanting to be a part of the learning process. During that time for the winter, <clears throat> the boys would be interrupted in class to go out and cut the wood, bring it in for the next day. The girls, we would keep the room clean and swept for the next day. School programs were very important part of the learning process and also the churches. When I was 12 years old, I wanted to be a part of the growth of the school and community because that was a part of my mother and father's life. So I asked the principal to let me play every morning for the devotion at school. And I played for the devotion. Then I started playing for two churches in the community. And also, I would play for funerals. Of course, I didn't like that because I was afraid of funerals, and of course, my mother and father insisted that I do it, so I had to do it. My mother and father were very outstanding citizens in the community. My father had a big truck that he would haul cotton and whatever to make a living. He also used the same truck to take us to school on rainy and cold days. And also he would pick up the children in the community for them to have a ride also. So finally one day he decided that he would turn this bus, this truck into a school bus. He confronted the school trustees to let him use the truck for a bus. They gave him permission. Finally, the whites received a new school bus, and the blacks received 
their bus. We were happy to get a bus like that. So my father, I'm sure, I think he was paid around $150 a month to drive the bus. Men in the community served as mechanics to keep the bus running. Many times the old bus would drop by the wayside. And of course, they were there to get it going again. I tell you, teachers and students in those days worked together, the community, to have a better way of life for their children. I am still working with my community. I love it. I still own the share of my land that was given to me. I am happy to know that I have been a part of the growth. I grew up in New Hope Baptist Church. The church now is 106 years old. I wanted the church to be remembered in the Texas Historical Society. I applied in January of this year. The Texas Historical Society gave us a historical marker <clears throat> to be placed at this church sometime this year. So we are looking forward for that dedication soon as, as it comes. My first job teaching was in Wheelock, Texas, Hearn, Texas, Bryan, Texas, and I retired in the Dallas Independent School District. While I was teaching in Bryant, Dr. Cecil Toles from Dallas was invited to speak for our in-service training. I knew him because he was from Carroll, Texas, which is about 15 or 16 miles from Wheelock, Texas. Dr. Toles encouraged me to apply in Dallas for a job and he said, you need to change and come to a better place. I applied. Immediately, I received an invitation for an interview from Dr. Yule D. Walker, assistant superintendent here in Dallas, Texas. He interviewed me. The interview went well. I left with a good feeling that I had the job. When I left, before I left, Dr. Walker praised all of my credentials, and I was very happy. Through it all, we have always found ways to make a positive difference in our lives across the decades. My grandparents, Sam and Lucy Mitchell, my mother and father, Elijah and Amanda Mitchell, always told us to develop high ideas, trust in God, give rather than receive. Today, I feel blessed that I have obeyed my parents, my grandparents, my teachers, the ministers, everyone that had a part of my life. And I want to say to you today, thank you for inviting me. And I have enjoyed meeting all of you. Thank you, and may God bless you. I knew she'd do a good job. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you, Estelle. <clears throat> okay. What we're going to talk about now is going from documents that had been created into a digital format to a book. So our original challenge was that there was no original uh, digital documentation, and then I'm going to tell you what we do after that. But, um, 
As Estelle has already told you, she and her friends were very disappointed when a new version of the history of Robertson County contained almost no names of Negroes who had contributed to the growth of the community. And she expressed her disappointment to the author, and I think he probably mumbled something, but then he died soon after that. He never had to do anything. <laughs> and she said that she was going to do something about it because she remembered all these things. And that, her, that's the genesis of our getting started on this. So although her immediate family had moved to Dallas, Estelle spent a great deal of time back in Wheelock, where other family members still lived. She was very active in organizing special events, particularly those associated with the family's New Hope Baptist Church. And when Estelle organizes an event, it's done right. <laughs> she prepared handwritten programs, which were then typed by her daughter, Derry, and her granddaughter, Maya, into very well done brochures containing detailed histories and the names of everyone who are participated in any way, including funding, with that particular celebration. And when, when they had the event, it was, I, she, she brought me the, the uh, final documentation that they shared when they were having an event. Very professional looking. So she saved each one of those things. And I'm sorry to say, or happy to say, that working with Estelle is kind of like you, you have an onion with all these layers of skin and they open up one at a time. And that's how I received her information. She'd bring me one of these things from a particular event at the church. And let's say they were rehanging a bit about an old bell that had been there a long time ago. This was just full of goodies of all information and names and pictures and everything else. And she'd bring me that one. She didn't tell me she had other things that were similar to that for other events. So gradually through the way, she's given me more and more information. But our, our challenge was to take the information that looked beautiful, but it was not digitized. It was typed and it looked beautiful, very nice presentation, but it wasn't digitized. So our challenge then was to organize and digitize the material and then find a place to preserve it and share it. So what um, my job was to take the typed versions of these things and uh, copy them in my copy machine and I handed them off to Ed Millis, who has been our supporter in so many ways in this project. And uh, he scanned those digital copies, and then he OCR'd them to make the minor corrections that you usually get when you do an OCR project. So, um, and then wh where, where were we going to find a place to, to put these things, to preserve them for other people, sharing that way? So over the last several years, we've had a couple of presentations in our DGS group that were talking about this portal to, to uh, Texas history. And I remembered those opportunities, even though I didn't remember the details. And I contacted the portal management to explore it further as a possible repository for Estelle's memories. And so um, uh, we did talk with uh, uh, Drianna Belden, who's the manager. And she named a man named Jacob, whose nickname is Jake Mangum, as our technical uh, contact. And so we supplied the names of the three basic topics that we were going to submit and put up on the portal. And uh, we established Estelle as an individual contributor to the portal. Now, in the portal, uh, you can come in under a, a bigger umbrella. If there's already an organization you're with that's appropriate, you can come in as a contributor through that umbrella. And it, but we wanted Estelle to be her own. This seemed important, so it took us a bit longer to be able to provide all the information about Estelle that needed to be done and also come up with the, the names and the content of the three programs. It took us a bit longer than if she'd just come in under someone else's umbrella. But it was important to me that she be there. And it's also useful for people that are looking up and finding the things on the portal she's put there that they can also look and find her full biography and all the information you'd want to have to know how you could trust the documents that you're looking up there. So, so we did choose the individual contributor role. And uh, we submitted the segments to the portal. Now, about halfway through the several months that it took us to get the information on the portal, uh, to finalize those things, and there was, there was a lot of tweaking we had to do to put it and make it just right. But it so happened that DGS would be staging its annual summer institute and one of the participants in that was going to be Jake Mangum, who was our contact with the portal. And he was going to speaking about the portal as a portion of this uh, couple of days uh, lecture that we have. 
So seizing the opportunity, I contacted him and asked him whether he'd be willing to meet briefly after he'd done his presentation with Estelle and Ed and I. So the originator and recipient of a portal piece could enjoy meeting in person. So Jake was pleased to spend a few minutes talking with her and this is a picture of us all together. Uh, lovely bunch, eh, what? <laughs> but anyway, after Jake went on to do other things as part of his program, we experienced the unexpected pleasure of watching a small line of DGS members and guests lined up to speak further with Estelle, and we all went home beaming. That was a great day. So in December, in December of 19, uh, 2015, we were notified by Jake that all the three segments were available on the porter, portal, and here's how you get to them. And if you'll notice the thing, the PEMA and large caps at the end, that's where they put the identification of the person who is submitting the material. And the P just means a partner, but the EMA is Estelle Mitchell Adams, so I think you can find it. But anyway, you can, you, that's how you can reach and look at her things. And the three things were named the Negro Churches of Wheelock, the Wheelock Colored School, and the Wheelock Afro-American Cemetery. Okay, so the next thing we did, or actually did while we were preparing the other things for the portal, we asked whether there was somebody up at the University of North Texas that could do oral interviews, and so we were referred to a man named Todd Moya, who was the head of that group. What? Oh, you're not, oh, you see it, you see it, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll explain it now. We, that was going to be a pop-up surprise, but anyway, uh, and uh, so he appointed uh, one of their more promising grad students from UNT to be Tiffany Smith, who would come and uh, do this interview with Estelle, and Estelle got to select whether she where she wanted this to happen. They could have done it up at UNT or any other place or at her home, and she is selected to have them come to her home. So uh, along the way, Ed and I got permission to be mice in the corner for this so we could listen to what the, uh, what the interview was going on. And uh, her daughter and granddaughter were there, and they were in, the, in, in one part of the house because they were preparing a nice little luncheon for when the thing was over. We were in the front room, and this is the front room there, and Estelle's home is beautifully decorated with lots of interesting things in it, and so you can see it's lovely there. But before the interviewer got there, the granddaughter said, could we take your picture? So this is a picture they took of the three of us, and we love this picture until we realized there was a bird sitting on top of Ed's head. <laughs> so anyway, as the interview went on, and it was very interesting, uh, as an aside, uh, as Estelle's daughter and her granddaughter, while they were stationed back in the kitchen den area, apparently had several occasions during the interview to say, Ah, oh, we've never heard that before. So they were hearing new things in the interview. And one of the things that I heard that I had not ever heard from her before was most interesting. Uh, Tiffany, the interviewer, asked her what, if anything, she and the other teachers who had bachelor's degrees uh, would do when they heard that integration was going to occur. And Estelle and her, and her friends knew that what they needed to do and stated with, and they needed to get better qualified. So they all went back starting to work at Prairie View A&M to work on their master's degrees. And these were mature women who had children that they had to find new grandparents or somebody else to sit for. And it was, it was a, a lot of work to do that, but they knew that's what they needed to do, and they did. They, they got their master's degrees, and it was a good thing to do. Right, Estelle? <laughs> <laughs> she has since then, after she moved up to Dallas, uh, done some postgraduate work up at UNT, as a matter of fact. But they knew what to do to get ready for integration. I, I thought that was a really, really good thing to know about. Okay, so the oral interview tapes were then processed by Tiffany and her group back at UNT and then returned to Estelle uh, for her review with the instructions that she could change, add, or delete anything she wanted to to make her responses satisfactory to her. So after her changes were implemented, then she received two copies of a nicely bound book, and this was of the oral interview. Very nice keeper for her that way. And uh, just a note from me, I had, for some reason, was hoping an oral interview would also be a videotaped interview. Not, it was oral. And we have never uh, been able to videotaping of Estelle doing anything. However, today, as we sit here and you're part of the audience today, Tony and his friends are taping this, and we will have uh, some uh, pictures of Estelle doing the thing that she does, and they may end up online and available for people. We don't see. If it's good, it might. If it's not, we won't let it. But <laughs> Anyway, I, I'm very happy that they're going to be able to do this, because Estelle, you have to see Estelle to really, truly appreciate her, in my opinion. 
So now back to the, uh, uh, we had done all this and the material was now available on a portal, the oral interviews were done, everything else was done, and we had what Ed was been doing, my aha moment. I had two of these, this was one of them. That we had finished all the things we set out to do by putting those three articles on the portal. Estelle had effectively remedied the lack of acknowledgement of black contributions to the history of Wheelock and Robertson County. And we had lots and lots and lots of names. <laughs> But we decided there might be even more understanding of their contributions to Wheelock if Estelle's Mitchell family was documented more completely. So we had the opportunity to create a book. So we could do a book by adding a chapter about the Mitchell family. Uh, Estelle's father, Elijah, was very influential in the community and he had the knack of identifying and fixing problems without antagonizing. That's a good bunch of qualities to have. Uh, and that school bus was a great story. Uh, what, what I didn't find out, and I've just heard a little bit of it today, he, he, he put a, a sign saying school bus on the first truck he used, and then he put that sign on the old school bus he got, and then, and then that broke down, and they finally gave him another one. And it turns out he got a, later on a, a pension from the state for, for being part of the school staff. <laughs> that was cool, I like that. <laughs> Okay, now uh, what we needed also was to create a detailed annotated index, and this was going to be my bailiwick. There were so many names in this book with all the chapters in it, just so many names. If you just took and made an index that had a person's name and you had page this, 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 and this, and you could have 20 pages to do it, nobody could use an index like that. It would wear you out just looking at it. So I knew that what we needed to do was do an index that showed in the index the activity that was going on. So you, you could see church activities or you could see cemetery activities and various things. So my index, which actually ended up to be 43 pages long, but it was necessary because there were so many contributed so many things, and I think it will be much more usable by the people that are buying the book, particularly those with, with ancestors who were part of this crew that was doing all this contributing in this time period. So um, let's see. So, so the last thing I also wanted to do, I had done a lot of research on Estelle's family, and I had a database that now numbered more than a thousand people in it. And these were either direct descendants or collabor uh, collaterals or other people associated with them along the way, and, and no, that would be a book in itself to do that. That wasn't what we were after. Uh, but any anyway, I took the, uh, the database and simply took the first four generations, Sam and Lucy, the, gr the ex-slave grandparents, and all of their children, including Estelle's father, and then all of his children, including Estelle. So that's what's in it. And it didn't have dates, it didn't location, I think it's just a, a little small thing at the very end that lets you see the relationships. And that's useful because we also added an images portion in there, which were mostly images of the various members of Estelle's family, coming, including the, the slaves coming all the way down. And so by looking at the re relationship chart at the back, it lets you make better sense of that. So what you do next is, okay, I'm gonna do a book. What's gonna be the scope of that? And you need to know the, the, the locality and the time and the what. So it's the Wheelock community in Robertson County, Texas. And the time is the 1900s. And in truth, it's the uh, first half of the 1900s. And then what was gonna be the churches, the schools, the cemetery, plus the Mitchell family. So looking at the book specifications, I learned a little bit from Ed who has written many books and self-published them and he's enlightened me along the way with things. And he tells me, and I believe in it, if you print, uh, published a book that was eight and a half by 11 inches, the same size you use for everything else, it doesn't look as professional if you do it a smaller kind of book, a little more interesting. And he suggested that I just go to bookstores and libraries and look at what's there, looking at the fonts and looking at the sizes and the shapes till I found what looked to me like it would be useful. So I did that. And uh, I knew that it had to have an easy to read font because a lot of these people using this index in the back and reading about the thing needed a little help with their eyesight and it couldn't be too big, but it needed to be bigger than the usual 10 or 11 uh, pipe that they had. And I needed to be sure we understood the professional writing standards and then to do some investigation into self-publishing opportunities. So one of the things, uh, let's see. 
So here's the specs that I decided upon for some reason, six by nine and a fourth inches. And the font was Verdana, and it was 12 point for the text. And then we had a title there. And the title we originally had didn't say Remembering Negro Life. It said something else. And, and as I was saying, you may not decide upon the final title of your book till you're almost ready to go to press, but you need to have something there to be working with. So these are the basic specs for the book you're gonna put together. <coughs> and so what's next? At some point, you're going to reformat the book size from the 8.5 by 11 that you're not going to use anymore into the size of the one that's smaller, whatever its uh, dimensions are. And then once you've done that, you're going to make any adjustments uh, that need to be made. And one of the things you probably will happen is that if you've included pictures with your text and you put it into the smaller size, don't be panicked if you can't find them after changing the size. They are there. And with some fiddling, you'll recover them. <coughs> so, and I said try out some promising fonts until you get something you like and then apply them to the book. It's very easy to do. It's amazing how easy this is to do if you know that's what you want to do there. So anyway, you're probably going to make several practice books and you'll be using a paper cutter to trim the margins to do the size of the book that you're actually creating. And when you're almost finished, and you know you've got most of the material in there, including this 42-page index. <coughs> Print out a practice book and trim it the way you need it to do, and then measure it, because the thickness of that book is going to be an important thing to know when you ask somebody to make the cover for it. So the dimensions of the cover are depending on the thickness and also the other uh, uh, things you have about your book. So, so you go do that. But at some point, you reformat, and here's here's our bookmaker, everybody doesn't have a bookmaker, but we did in our team. <laughs> this is Ed Mellis, hard at work. He's a retired engineer who just loves making books, just, just about as much as he loves writing books, but he loves making them. And so you can see his little den there. He's got an industrial size stapler and little pieces of wood that you use to make cuts, right? And all kinds of tools that are sitting there. I don't know what you'd call them, but then, uh, and this, giant paper cutter, and he informs me that it is not a paper cutter, it is a shearer, S-H-E-A-R-E-R. -E -E but this is, this is heavy duty equipment, and he used it a whole lot on my books and on his books too. But anyway, voila, next one, there he is, and this is a practice book. And this was out the formal cover on it, but this got the tail on it. It's the same size, the same thickness, it's probably gonna eventually almost be, and we were happy to do that, and so, <clears throat> the title may, at this point might not be your final choice. It wasn't ours, but time is coming closer, needing to finalize that and anything else that might be needed in order to make the cover. So you identify a cover artist, and it was easy for us. Ed has a daughter, Beverly Millis Haskin, who lives up in the Boston, Massachusetts area, and she's an artist. So she received several pictures. We sent her maybe eight or ten different pictures of things that might be part of the cover. And she spent not too long a time about thinking about it. She's very good at this. And she has three, three options for us to look at. And uh, we looked at the first one, and they all came in within a day or so of each other. The first one looked good. The second one looked good. And the third one was it. It was it. We were very, very pleased with that. And I'm delighted with this cover. It, it encompasses in it all, all the things about Estelle and her family and what they did, I think. Okay, the next thing you're going to get, you'd like to get an endorsement for your book. And Estelle mentioned in her talk that she had very recently worked with the Robertson County Historical Commission with a lady named Kathy Hedrick to acquire the Texas State Historical Marker for her little church in Wheelock. And this had been accomplished in a very short time because the historical material that had already been put on the portal. When this lady that was receiving the application to put to the state of Texas got the material from the portal, they had everything they needed to justify the the historical marker, and other people have commented, it spent them years to get this kind of a, a thing for, an, for a place. So I contacted Ms. Hedrick to see if she would be willing to d review a draft copy of a sales book with the possibility of endorsing it, and she would, and she did. And here is her endorsement. It is worth gold. I've never seen one I'd like better than that. And the part I like the best about it, and the, star for the, the, first, the second paragraph is that Estelle uh, Adams is a true storyteller. And then at the end she said, I learned so much about the untold story of the black community in Huilat. 
because she recorded stories passed down from earlier generations. This important piece of history of the Wheelock community will never be forgotten. We owe Estelle a tremendous gift of gratitude. That's a nice endorsement to have and, and heartfelt by those people. <laughs> Okay, the next thing you need to do is get an ISBN number because you've got to have that on the book cover. So there's several ways to do that. You can get it as an in individual, and these are two sites you can go to that kind of gives you instructions for doing that. Uh, if you happen to be ha going to have a printer, printer book who is a real book printer, the book pr printer might have bought a whole, um, what would you call it, a whole block, a whole block of ISBN numbers. One ISBN number is $125, probably still is. A whole block of them is like 300 or something, whatever it is. You, you get a whole bunch of them for a very small amount, but are you ever going to write eight books or whatever it is? But a printer supply might have that, and they might sell you one without you having to, to uh, do it all yourself. And then the other thing, you could have a friend who had some extras. But there's a caveat about this, because uh, apparently whoever buys a block their name is associated with all those ISBN numbers in that block. And I don't think it really amounts to anything, but we wanted Estelle to have her own number and not be associated with somebody we didn't even know on that. So, so Ed worked with Derry, uh, Estelle's daughter, and they, they acquired the, um, the ISBN number. And here is the cover, much larger than this, of course. But anyway, it has on it uh, the pictures of the two ex-slave uh, grandparents. and. Uh, the, the title, and here's the school children. On the back is a great picture of Estelle, which, believe it or not, was just taken last December. She looked pretty good for 87, 88 or 89, yes? <laughs> and this wonderful uh, acknowledgement and endorsement. I was very, very pleased with that. So, so then you create the book cover. And uh, this was taken a little bit before we had the final cover, but this is my second aha moment. This was a practice book that had almost everything in it, and Ed had made five copies of the cover to wrap around just so we could play and make our own models, you know? And this was the first one he'd put the cover on, and I'm sitting there holding it, and it is a book, and I have to tell you, it was a very emotional moment for me. I hope those of you in the audience, some of you, if you have never experienced this kind of thing, will do so. It was just an amazing moment, so. Almost through here, folks. Okay. Oh, 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 then uh, let me talk about 10 years ago when DGS had its 50th anniversary, one of our, our big projects then was increasing the number of books on the Dallas genealogy section's shelves from about 94, 95,000 to 100,000 books. And uh, we, did, we did make that goal. It was a wonderful goal to make. It was really well done. Lots of people participated in that. But the only way we could count one book as being one more additional one to the tally we had was if it had been cataloged. So it put in my mind that cataloging a book was a very important part of producing a book. So th that was one side effect. Not only did we get the, the, the goal that we reached back then, but I gained a lot more respect for the cataloging process, and I consider it now a vital part of adding a new book to any library. And I wanted to celebrate this, now that we had the books back from the printer, I wanted to celebrate this as a major milestone for Estelle's book. And one of my favorite behind the scenes DPL workers is Richard Glancy, who although he has retired officially as a longtime cattler, continues to return to the library as a volunteer. So with approval from DPL, he was persuaded to be the person to receive Estelle's book. He's going to kill me because he's back there looking and saying, oh, no. <laughs> but the printing, Estelle's book was completed a couple of weeks ago. And the following week, we had a little gathering on the eighth floor as Estelle presented her book to Richard. So here she's doing that. And then the next slide will be the gang that gathered. We had a, a, who, whoever was around came into this, and it was a very fun afternoon. I think I enjoyed it, and I hope Richard enjoyed it, too. Anyway, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's the, some of the eighth floor staff people. Some of our volunteers and just patrons that have to wander around. But it was a fun afternoon to do, and I thought it was a true milestone to get your book into the library. And one other thing I must mention about doing this, part of the cataloging uh, will uh, 
cause uh, an entry in something that's called the WorldCat computer database. Now librarians know about this and many people that have done publishing things know about it too, but most of the rest of us don't. Uh, but I've heard about it before and I've looked upon it sometime when I was trying to see if I was working on, on a problem in Michigan, let's say, in a county in Michigan, wanted to see if any book or any manuscript or any newspaper had, had things that were stored in any library in the United States. And, and I did find some that way, and that's how you use, okay. Well, as part of this cataloging process, there is now an entry for Estelle with the book information, the title of the book, and the and information about her, and the subjects, and you can find it e either if you said, put in her name, or you put in the title of the book, or you said uh, something about Wheelock history, or African Americans, Texas Wheelock history, or Wheelock, Texas genealogy. A lot of ways to get to that. And one of the nice things is that when, when you find something from your search, you can see what libraries have this particular book. And if, for instance, we didn't have that book here in Dallas, you could find the closest place that might have it, and maybe you could arrange some in a library loan, who knows. Anyway, it's a very useful thing, and I didn't realize that was gonna come as part of the cataloging, but thank you, Richard. <laughs> No, that happened automatically because what Richard did in cataloging it in our library. Yeah, there, see a lot of kind of secret things go on. You don't need to know them, but when you know them, you see opportunities there, I think. Okay, so uh, my last big slide is gonna be the villagers, but I wanted to show you, uh, to tell you that after that's over, we're gonna put up a slide that tells you about a very interesting and useful book that I found after we got most of this stuff done preparing our book. Uh, but it's a book, uh, uh, thing is called uh, Setting Yourself Up to Self-Publish. And there's a series of eight books that's up there on the eighth floor, and they're all in a section we have on, on an open shelf there that's about how to write your memoirs and all kinds of things like that. We have a very nice library. And one of those eight books is this one called uh, If You're Going to Self-Publish. And I looked at that and I said, oh man, I wish I'd had that when we started, what we were doing. And uh, and then I said, I wish we could take them home with us, because most things up in the eighth floor, you have to leave there, they're reference material. And lo and behold, I was told that the staff was clever enough that they identified out of those eight books, they identified three of them were particularly useful for genealogy, and they bought second copies. And those second copies are in another area that I didn't find out until recently. You'd think I'd, as a volunteer I'd know about, but there's a little area, uh, kind of a U-shaped area, that's got a shelf on it, and every book on it has a blue, uh, tape on it like that. It means those books are available for you to take out with a Dallas Library card. And these three books that they'd separate are there and so you can actually get one of these books, take it home with you and do whatever you need with it and then bring it back because you're a library member. So I was really pleased about that. But anyway, the very last thing is going to tell you how, to, what the information about that particular book. But what I want to do right now is talk about our villagers, because this is what this thing was all about. This is the last big one you're going to have to see, but I'm going to go slowly through it, because I think it's a really important one. These are all the people that were our, uh, really did uh, play a significant part in putting this book together. First, of course, is Estelle, the author and writer, and then Derry, her daughter, and her, her granddaughter, Maya Hooper, who transferred the handwriting memories to printed text, and then Ed Millis for scanning and OCRing, building the book, getting the ISBN and supporting us and every other time we got a snag in something. He was really handy. <laughs> and then the portal to Texas, uh, Deanna Belden, who is, I understand, a member of our society here now. Uh, uh, she is the manager of that and Jake Mangum, who was the one who was our contact there. And then to Kathy Hedrick from the society down in Wheelock for her wonderful book endorsement. And Beverly Haskin, Ed's daughter for the cover design. I did the genealogical research and the editing and the indexing. And I have to emphasize, uh, I edited, Ed, Estelle gave us the material. She wrote the book and I edited it, but she wrote the book and it's her voice that's heard and I'm so happy about that. And Joanne Corney, who gave me assistance with some legacy applications. And then the DPL staff, including Gayla Bush and, um, and Richard Glancy. And then the DGS members and the Wednesday DPL volunteers are Mary Frances Stevens and Joanne Corney and me. We've been on, the, on Wednesday detail duty for many, many years and every time I'd come in, I'd have a new story or problem to tell them about what we were doing and they've been very supportive and helpful on that. And then DGS board uh, members, Kathleen Murray and Tony Hansen for the photography, for the solid advice and help along the way and videotaping today's episode. 
And then we have several members here from our exercise classes at the cardiovascular center. And once they found there was a book along the way, they would cheerlead for us and they'd come down here to hear this. So actually we've come full circle from the time Estelle and I first met until here's the day we've got the book ready. And I'm, I'm, that was just, and the really good news is Estelle and I are still active in that class. <laughs> so that's it. I thank you very much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. Your membership dues are supporting this and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, I hope you consider joining. You can become a member for as little as $35 a year, and you can join by going to our website, dallasgenealogy.org, and clicking on the Membership tab.